EWC has the potential to become, since the majority rule, the biggest barrier to entry into the modern economy for millions of South Africans, disadvantaged South Africans. I, I will even go further and say that it has the potential to destroy the very unusual, unstable, complicated, and unreliable economic organization that has been created in Southern Africa since the mineral revolution of the 19th century. To understand EWC as a barrier to entry and the potential harm it will do to the economy and society, and indeed South Africa as a unified state, we need a framework. I'm a firm believer that if we want to deal with this narrative of EWC, we need to have an intellectual, theoretical, and conceptual framework to confront it. South Africa's uh, economic development since the, since the 19th century had by the 1970s resulted in a highly sophisticated modern economy. It was by far the most advanced economy in Africa, and in many parts, it was on a par with parts of the first world. However, alongside it, alongside it, it coexisted a demographically more numerous third world component, which was kept at a distance through barriers to entry, with only some unskilled and semi-skilled urban dwellers having access to parts of its extensive institutional and productive components. These barriers to entry are well known and include geographical barriers like these include, like, the pass laws, the Group Areas Act, these are the geographical barriers, and the occupational barriers like the racial labor laws developed under the civilized labor policy. What is important from our perspective is that these barriers to entry were essentially based on restricting private property rights over factors of production. The ability to own, transfer, sell, and, ex and exercise full authority over the use of property was severely restricted for the black majority. On African reserves, land were communally owned and under trusteeship of the chiefs. Labor could not freely move to urban areas, and even if they could, were severely restricted from selling their labor. Entrepreneurs could not use their initiative to find op opportunities in the marketplace, and capital could not be readily, readily accumulated because of a host of regulations, some related to other factors of production. The result was that markets could not effectively penetrate the third world component of South, Africa's, uh, South African society to reflect real values, factor values, and production capacity was therefore seriously curtailed. This dual nature of the South African economy had by the 1970s developed distinctive groups of insiders and outsiders, largely drawn along racial lines. However, many African urban dwellers started to enjoy increased access and thus some of the benefits of the modern economy. They had become a unique class of insiders by the time the Vian and Rickert commissions uh, made their insider status official. The traditional uh, white insiders did not ne need to have protection when these some of these particular geographical barriers were eventually lifted by the 1980s due to improvements in human capital and institutional arrangements. They were, of course, those in the lowest strata of white society that were vulnerable to, the, to these uh, seismic, uh, seismic changes. The new non-white insiders, however, managed through rapid unionization and political protest to entrench their positions, often under the slogan of removing the apartheid wage gap. It meant that as millions of South Africans were at last allowed to freely move into cities and to try and integrate into the modern economy, new barriers of entry has, uh, has come up. As wages increase to try and lessen the mythical um, apartheid wage gap, the new arrivals were faced with ind industry shedding labor be and becoming more capital intensive. To add to it all, the highly successful sanctions and disinvestment campaigns saw an outflow of capital in businesses that might have helped to absorb the new arrivals into the economy. The new arrivals also arrived with major deficiencies on the human and social capital fronts, which further hampered their integration. The result was that by the 1994, South Africa had already a significant unemployment problem. 
which translated to about 3.6 million people unemployed. Uh, the percentage-wise was 31.5. These developments brought South Africa face-to-face -face with an institutional constraint that it has tried to manage with barriers to entry ever since unification in 1910. It is this institutional constraint that the, uh, that the ANC government failed to recognize after 1994 and indeed made it worse with new barriers to entry, like the labor laws. Let me brief, briefly try and develop a model to set out these particular constraints. Now, the modern economy works something like this. To those who have done economics, it's uh, quite clear. You have your household selling factors of production, receiving income, can buy goods and services, some income used for tax, some saved, some for bought for buying foreign uh, goods and services. And all everything, according to the theory, economic theory, should move towards an equilibrium. But what if you have a chronic deficiency of entrepreneurs? Will you have the institutions that will create the demand for labor and therefore allow them to be readily be absorbed in the modern labor market? It is this deficiency that has hampered South Africa ever from the, sorry, from the beginning. The, okay. Now, what this therefore meant is that this, what I call institutional uh, constraint, came to the fore from 1980s onwards. This uh, entrepreneurial problem was first identified, well, uh, effectively identified by the late uh, Stellenbosch academic J.L. Sadi, who wrote that in other countries, the entrepreneurial managerial class was something like 5 to 10 percent. In South Africa, it's 2 percent and can, is even less than uh, that because jobs were simply filled. Now, on top of this, let us now quickly move because I need to... Sorry. Okay. Now, what happened then? As people moved into the labor market, uh, the millions of South Africans, you had human capital deficiencies, households coming with human capital deficiencies, social capital, de capital deficiencies, and there was no way that the existing institutions could absorb people into the modern labor market. Now, this is where I'm going to use a little bit of economics to explain the significance of these particular developments. Now, here, um, what I will use is a known to economists is the classical supply curve. That supply curve, or sorry, the horizontal part shows national output, and the vertical part shows price. That CAS curve represents your maximum potential output if you use all your factors of production. I'm going to join this with a second component, which I sh looks like the Keynesian uh, supply curve, but this supply curve shows your institutional um, capacity. What it means simply, it's along that uh, supply curve, you can combine factors of production in institution to produce real output. Let me combine them now and go back to the 1970s. By the 1970s, the modern South African economy was basically like you had these elaborate restrictions that were put in place that uh, stopped people from moving into the modern economy. And the two was essentially in equilibrium. 1980s onwards, as people started moving in, and especially the 90s, with uh, these particular type of deficiencies, the uh, CAS curve, which represent your factors of production, moved away from your institutional curve, and a gap opened up. I call that gap an enterprise gap. And that enterprise gap may, um, also represents what I call institutional unemployment. This is unemployment caused by the deficiencies of the institutional framework uh, within the modern economy to absorb the available labor, that, uh, the available factors of production. Um, so it's two very important concepts, the enterprise gap and institutional unemployment. What this meant is that even if you use macroeconomic policies, fiscal policy, monetary policy, you will simply sit with a scenario. You uh, boost aggregate demand. As you boost aggregate demand, you have that vertical part of, the, of this institutional curve uh, being the barrier to, uh, for, for the economy. You have higher inflation. You have balance of payments problems. And the result, ladies and gentlemen, is that you're still sitting with your institutional unemployment. <coughs> So anybody arguing, oh, we should just um, spend more, governments should do more, 
But through aggregate demand, that's not going to happen because you have that um, enterprise gap. Now, since 1994, through, and I'm going to be a little bit quick because I've been told, now, since 1994, the situation has come worse. Millions more people have come into, this, into the uh, modern economy, or tried to come into the modern economy. Second, you have people from all over Africa, and especially the most notable from Zimbabwe. Millions have come here. So it meant that your factors of production has increased from CS1 to CS2. Your enterprise gap has increased even further, and... Of course, in the meantime, you had elaborate transformation, you had restrictions to the private sector with the result that your INS curve, the vertical part, didn't uh, shift enough to absorb um, people. Now, let us move on a little bit further. Let us come now to EWC, and this is the danger of it. You will have, if you have EWC, you will, basically, uh, de you will basically destroy the very foundation on which this whole formal economy has been established since the 19th century, private property. You will have a contraction of your, um, of your, uh, of your sectors, that is your primary, your uh, secondary and tertiary sectors. And in the meantime, you have more people coming into the economy, so what you in effect will do is this was 1994, you will sit with this even bigger enterprise gap and you're more institutional unemployment. Because through that, if we go just back, sorry, that particular um, contraction will also have other, so, so for instance, you will have an increase in, in, in inflation, definitely. You will have, uh, with that contraction, more pressures on the existing uh, tax base. So government will find it extremely difficult to pay uh, employees. So will it be the same like in Zimbabwe? And what I'm essentially trying to say, and I need to finish off now, is this. That institutional uh, unemployment, enterprise gap, and I'm really hoping this to these two concepts catch on as part of a new narrative, that is our real problem. And it, the EWC will make it much worse. What does it then mean now for, for us as the debate continue? The difficulty that we have is that EWC has put into our, um, into our discourse, this is, and this is my biggest concern, is that it has brought together in our political arena all the ingredients for national tragedy. These include some of the basest and worst of human attributes, envy, jealousy, and spite, thickened with, a great, with that great enemies of affairs of state, that great enemy, emotion. These ingredients have displaced reason, which have left little scope for rational discourse. All have the potential to turn South Africa into a Hobbesian state within a twinkling of an eye. If cool heads do not prevail, we will return to the type of violent episodes that dominated Southern Africa during the 19th century. I'll finish there. The paper is available. It's a little bit more dense, but if you want to read it, uh, it should be available from the Free Market Foundation. Thank you very much.